Hey guys, okay, so before we roll the rest of this episode, I uh, just want to toss a, a disclaimer out there. Uh, there's going to be some uh, audio interference um, here and there that cuts in and out. It doesn't last very long, but we want you to be aware of it. Um, we explained later on in the intro that uh, portions of this interview, actually on our end, were lost due to a um, failure in the uh, recording app that we use for this uh podcast so um just wanted to toss it out there that some of the snippets of the interview have a little static interference and it's nothing to um be worried about it it does go away i mean it happens maybe like three four times but um yeah aside from that uh we want to thank the guys in young medicine for uh recording the audio on their end so we could actually bring you this interview uh yeah so hope you enjoy do you like listening to podcasts? Of course you do. You're listening to a podcast right now. What about getting paid to listen to podcasts? Well, now you can. Sign up at podcoin.com and get paid to listen to your favorite podcasts. It's free. Get paid to listen, save up your podcoins, cash them in for prizes like Amazon or Starbucks gift cards, or you can donate to charity like we do. Use our offer code SUPERPOD to get 300 PodCoins on us. It's available in the App Store and on Android. It's the only way that we listen to podcasts now, and it could change the way that you listen to podcasts. Now on with the show. This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. I don't know why. Just, eh. You're just full of sound effects. Eh. I, don't, I, I, <laughs> I don't feel good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having a great day. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, am I hungry. Yeah. <laughs> you want something to drink? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Welcome to a special edition of the Super Media Bros Podcast. Yes. Yeah. The Super Media, yeah! <laughs> I'm Midnight Agent Raw. And I'm a gummy! Oh, God. oh no! <laughs> ah, fuck! I've been thinking about re-recording how I t- say my name, so it might be a contender there. There you go. And I'm Okami. And I'm Okami! And I'm a gummy! And I'm a goo! No, I ain't gonna do it that way. No, it's, it's okay. Um, If you haven't seen from our social media this week... um. We got a chance to finally sit down with a band we really enjoy, Young Medicine. Dim boys. Dim boys. Um, we got to sit down and talk about their new full-length debut album, Interlinked. And we fucking love this album so much. Um, but just interviewing these guys in general has been a long time coming for the both of us. Yeah, we get to find out not just the musical aspect of each individual person, but we each get the bullshit with them about you know random stuff in general but primarily they're oh so much love for the b films cult cinema films stuff like that yeah it's really cool that we had that kind of connection in general when we you know because we bullshit with them not on the podcast also right. so just kind of picking their brains a bit and figuring out you know what musically makes them tick and some of this some of the process that went into writing this album and they're just really great dudes, and they're really funny. Oh, <laughs> so, yeah. Um, one thing we do have to point out, which um, is kind of hilarious. So we recorded this interview, but the um, the program we, we used to record this, we got all the way through, decided to take a giant shit on us, and we completely lost the uh, master audio track on it. It's just It's gone. Don't know where the fuck it's at. But in light of that, the boys from Young Medicine happened to record on their end the whole entire interview, yeah. which we were thankful for. So in turn, like the normal routine we do, we're actually going to hear it mostly from their perspective in a way, audibly, 
Yeah, I mean, you guys sit here and you listen to us bullshit enough as it is. So usually, like, when we do interviews, it's mostly, like, done via phone calls. So you kind of hear and you understand the fact that our guests are remote and on a phone. Well, this time, Cody and I are going to be on the phone, and which it's more important anyway because, I mean, you get to hear, uh, like, Brett, Josh, Michael, and Peter talk, you know, because there's four guys. So... You'll get to hear them audibly and very cleanly, and it it wound up working out in that sense. They're the stars of the show, anyway. Yeah, so. and you know we were going to we were going to sit down and try to re-record our questions and things like that, but when we sat to really think about it, we feel like it would have taken away the in, like the actual energy of the conversation, All right? As you know, as it took place, so we're just we're going to present the interview in its entirety as recorded by the guys in Young Medicine. We really, once again, appreciate the shit out of these guys for pretty much saving the fucking day on this interview. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Their medicine saved us. Exactly. It's like a reverse <laughs> interview, yeah. if you think about it. Like, we're, we're still asking the questions, but like... The, we're, the, we're, we're on the other end yeah. of this whole like audible sensation here. Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, you're going to get to hear that. And uh, stay tuned after the interview. We are going to be uh, playing uh, one of our favorite tracks on this album from these guys. Definitely. So, yeah. You want to shut the fuck up and just let them talk now? Yeah, because you can barely hear us anyway. Okay, that's cool. So <laughs> get get it in right now while you still fucking can. Be as loud as possible. Be fucking loud! Okay. Okay. Yeah, that was enough. Mm. All right, man. So, <laughs> all right, everybody out there, here's... Brett, Josh, Michael, and Peter, a.k.a. Young Medicine. Go! I'm Midnight Agent Raw at Amo Comedy, and we're sitting down with a band that, God damn it, it's been a long time coming to get these guys on this show. Uh, they just released their debut album, Interlinked. It's out now on every fucking thing you can possibly listen to it on. Young Medicine. What's up, guys? Hey! Uh, hello. It's not on title, Hi. though. All skills were here! No, it needs to be like that old school, like, Max... Uh, was it uh, Maxwell commercial? Mm-hmm. When the dude's sitting in front of the, the sound system and it just starts blowing up everything away? Mm-hmm. That's what needs to happen. Like, get them on the big ass loud. Get to the last drop. Blow it away. Mm-hmm. So, um, why don't you guys introduce yourself to everybody that's out there listening? Uh, I'm Peter and I play bass and I sing a little. <laughs> My name's Josh and I play guitar and I sing and I, uh, play the Adobe Creative Suite 99% of the time. My name's Brett. I play keys and I sing a lot. And I also do the uh, recording and audio production for us. I am Michael and I play the drums. Hell yeah! (laughs) 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 It's it's nice to finally have you guys on here, honestly, because we've been fucking listening to you guys probably since the end of last year, like earlier this year when you guys dropped uh, Shinji. Yep. And we just, we immediately loved it. Like it was just like instantaneous, like this is fucking phenomenal. We have to talk about it. And we, I mean, aside from that, we, we kind of just hit it off with like our mutual love of cult films from the 80s and shit yeah. like that. So it was, it was really awesome finding that common ground with, you know, people we've never met. And like Cody, like you and I both attest to this. We're from the South. You know, we've never met a fucking stranger, so that was a really cool thing. Yeah, it was really cool to hit it off with you guys that way, too. You guys are out in the um, country, did you say? Like, you had country internet. I know you told me that before. Yeah, Louisiana, like, southwest Louisiana, depending on where you're at. Like, we have cable and internet stuff out here. <laughs> but, dude, certain areas out here, like, the area that I live in has a basically, like, a gridlock over the area with this certain company and they won't allow anybody else to come out here and service. Oh man. Wow. Yeah, it's bullshit. <laughs> I mean, we're not far from bandos and canoes out here, so yeah. Yeah, shit. We're not that far from the fucking Gulf of Mexico. It's uh, probably about an hour. Crazy. Gulf of Mexico. Nice. They wow. don't yeah, have Gulf down, in Mexico. Yeah, the you get down that way, it's, it's hard. you're hard pressed to find anything <laughs> decent. Besides good seafood. Yeah, exactly. That's the one thing we but, don't uh, have here. Middle of the country. Mm-hmm. Seafood? I'm telling you, man. Y'all need to- oh, they're, they're actually, uh, there was a restaurant in... Um, Long John uh, Silver's doesn't count. <laughs> 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 no, there, there was a restaurant that was briefly open 
in, in uh, kind of our like old town district that they flew in seafood daily and and it was kind of expensive and it's like okay this doesn't seem maintainable yeah i wonder why and that it, didn't last and it totally <laughs> wasn't it's gone now fish don't fly peter fish no one believes that <laughs> oh yeah Just have you seen me. the swordfish movie peter doesn't believe in narwhals a narwh narwhals <laughs> no that's <laughs> true story i legitimately we were actually in a recording session and Somehow narwhals came up, and I I refer to them as a mythical creature, <laughs> and and they were like, Peter, you know those are real, and I was like, Yeah, ha, ha shut the fuck up. Unicorn in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> it was like finding out Santa Claus is real. What? Wait, Santa Claus isn't real. <laughs> I mean, uh, it was like finding out. It was like finding out a. a it, Santa Claus is real. Oh my God, don't break all hopes and dreams. Moving on. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, a lot of people that may have not listened to you guys or have heard you for the first time, you know, which what was a good thing for us when we heard it was the, the sound that you guys had. Now, um, before we get into the sound development, like, how did you guys first meet each other and form the band and come up with the name? Oh, boy. Uh, Josh and I have been playing together for about 10 years now. Since the crib. The dawn of time. This is Brett and Josh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brett and Josh, and we were in band before this, and it just took that long to really figure out how to do it all. And how to kick out everyone that wasn't us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we knew Michael. He was a drummer out. in another band that we... We didn't steal, but we knew... Kinda, you kind of yeah, We definitely did. stole. But I let it happen. <laughs> and then and then Peter, we had recruited a few years, uh, maybe like a year and a half me, before Michael. Yeah. They recruited me out of high school and ruined my college career. It's like, yeah. hey, you want to... Someone did it to me earlier, so I'm just passing it on. You know, <laughs> pay it forward. Someday, someday Josh will get old and jaded and... Pay forward the Try curse. to sue the band for all the money in the world, and then we'll kick him out, and then I'll have to recruit a 17-year-old out of and high school. Just kind of trap him in an endless cycle of debt. Just, just like keep today. passing forward everything that's happened to him. It's the world's <laughs> cruelest joke. Pay it forward. But yeah, Brett and I have been playing together for like 10 years. Uh, kind of, we, we started as more of a kind of emo, orchestral, dark kind of music Let's Halloween thing, yeah. As you do in a post Chiodos world. Yeah, exactly. and then we uh we kind of evolved into whatever we are now with we our We saw current Blade lineup. Runner and it all went downhill from there. Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer though, Brett hadn't seen Blade Runner until like two days ago. That's not true at all. <laughs> that is not true. <laughs> it was at least three. At least three. <laughs> <laughs> Brett doesn't Apparently see movies. Shit. All right. I mean, just y'all sound in general, I heavily appreciate the synth inclusion just by far. I mean, everything else is stellar, but that's probably my favorite aspect is just the, the EDM and the synth feel to everything that's going to tie in together. Yeah, a lot of bands from the 2000s, like, for, for fun, a lot of them had synthesizer players and all kinds of stuff you know like and sample stuff yeah almost a gimmick but then they started getting rid of them and so on the band you know as far as metal and rock bands are concerned we thought that was something we could do to set ourselves apart by just go the opposite way and crank the synths up and and really focus on that yeah like basically resurrect the, the sound in a way yeah and it, it definitely um it definitely adds that um it factor dynamic to because like you know cody said everything else is just fucking phenomenal but cranking that element up in there it opens the door for so many like sub genres to like kind of peek their way into your sound like you have there's elements of like synth rock there's you know synth pop i mean there's pop music in general and that's the other thing that we enjoy a lot too is that the production value is really clean it's very um like it, it's just really good it's not like too raw where a lot of rock bands tend to try to go with that raw sound like yeah. Very polished with you guys. And, yeah, a lot of bands like to do, at some point in their careers, they'll do like an album that's kind of stripped down and raw. And I, I guess I kind of get that, especially since I record bands that like to do that. But we kind of try to do the opposite and <laughs> go super produced. If you saw one of our song session files, it, it looks insane. It's like hundreds of layers of just things going on at all times. 
And uh, that's, it takes us a while because since we do have access to everything, since Brett records it and we all kind of like, we work on it together, um, we're able to, and it's like a blessing and a curse, go in and refine and switch things up and add layers of vocals or add more synths, take things out. But right. it, that's how it ends up how it is, though. And that's got to be really good because um, a lot of bands out there struggle to actually be able to record the way they want to. Like, they have to play, you know, a ton of shows, uh, save up money from the gigs, or, you know, get somebody to help fund it, you know, or just to get studio time. And even if they do it, like, DIY, you know, they're they're having to do it as you know best as they can with what they have. That's exactly and how we started. To, DIY, yeah, not right. only, you know, because it's cool DIY, but out of necessity and budget and we just kept doing it till we got a little better and it turned out the way we wanted josh is spot on about it being a blessing and a curse though because the i would say the the biggest drawback about doing it all in-house is that you don't have an outside opinion to be like this is it or this is enough or this is, <laughs> or like this where is do you shit. stop or like right. i mean it's it kind of helps that michael and i aren't as involved in the like initial writing sessions so we can kind of be that outside opinion and we'll be like oh that looks like shit or that sounds like shit <laughs> but but at the same time like you're stuck in this endless loop of okay this has to be better or this sub isn't high enough or there isn't enough like high end here and like all this crazy shit that josh just has a never-ending cycle of critiquing and then brett tweaking and that's why it took five years for the album to come out <laughs> No, I definitely understand that. Um, just you know, being in bands over the years and having like just some CDs recorded here and there over the uh, maybe the last like ten years or so, it is hard. Like if you, especially if you do it yourself. I think I was only ever in a situation once where we had the guy that was recording us. We asked him like, "Hey, we don't care if you tell us we fucking suck or <laughs> whatever. Like we want an honest opinion." So like, I've you're doing yourself a disservice before. otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, and. <clears throat> It's it's nice to have that dynamic there because it kind of it kind of reins you in some you know because I think everybody to an extent just we dig our own shit to a point where it's like okay we like it enough that we could do something with it but we are not going to be like totally honest and trash the shit out of it you know like we there's always something you'll have recorded that you're like we can tweak that later because it's rare that you come up with an idea where it's like this fucking sucks and you just got to get rid of it unless it's a flub or you know just something. yeah. Um, coming up with the sound, though, like, what was the major influence behind um, the way you guys sound? Because, I mean, like, we've said it a million times talking about you guys on our show. Like, it's it's really nice to see it, like, come back to the forefront, like, something like this. Well, also another part of it that I really dig is I know a lot of the metal and rock scene, they have this stigma where it's, very angry sounding very just like raw aggression to it but at the same time y'all portray it to where it sounds almost like power ballads just very uplifting to where you just you feel more positive about the day to like charge forward kind of feeling you know it just feels like more influential in a way yeah musically and then like it's cool because there's also that juxtaposition uh, position lyrically in some of the some of the tracks where it's like oh shit like there's some meaning behind it right like, to it but as far as the instrumentation sound like what was the like biggest influence for you guys to mesh this all together? Josh saw the movie Drive. That's it. <laughs> Five years ago, you know, you know everyone's intro to synthwave. Everyone hears a uh, night call, and then they're like, "Oh shit, this is a thing." Kavinsky. <laughs> yeah. That's it. No. Um. Uh, it's all over the place because we we all went through high school and like still do listen to a shit ton of uh, heavier music like metal and metalcore and all that stuff and we've we've written along those lines and then like before that like emo anthem music like my chemical romance 30 seconds to mars kind of stuff and then uh f for our current sound it, a lot of it really did come through uh getting more into kind of retro synth synthwave music i think and, the visual aspect yeah, also kind of influenced the sound exactly yeah it all ties in uh, for, yeah, I mean, it's very apparent, and that's cool to see. For, like, it, it, gives, 
it gives it away. Like it's it just the visual aspect that you guys put on in some of your videos and like your your uh, your art as far as like visual art and stuff. You can tell that's a major influence, and that's totally cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, we try we try to make the uh, the visual and audio aesthetic all kind of match up and be be one package deal, you know. All right. Yeah. Um, as far as songwriting for this album, like we kind of kind of want to get into um, the album Interlinked a bit because um, you guys were gracious enough to send us a copy to listen to before we did this, and I mean, even we listened to it, you know, front to back several times over. Hell, I bought the damn thing yesterday on Apple. Oh God, um, <laughs> we, we exist. And yeah, we fucking love this album so much. It was because um, we loved the stuff that you guys were doing before, like when you released Shinju and. Like when, especially then when Living Fiction came out, is gonna be like that was like the song that's gonna lead into this album. Cody and I just were blown away by the rest of it, honestly. Thank you. That's um, that's awesome to hear. No, seriously, like it, it's fucking excellent job, you know. And because we love music in general, but sometimes like it's very rare that we true say it, but like sometimes we can be dicks and hard asses when it comes to like when bands that we appreciate come out with something that is just fucking gross <laughs> yeah but no we enjoy the shit out of it and i know cody you were fucking impressed with that. With i mean that. the first two songs really do give you an idea of like what the rest of the album is and it's such a beautiful transition into everything afterwards i mean like you said living fiction came out and Sinju came out and we already kind of had an idea of what that was about but the way y'all compiled it all together to make it just this one big cohesive adventure is just phenomenal how it sounds. Yeah, like was Shinji the first thing you guys wrote for this, or did you already have some stuff in the can before? Oh, a lot of these songs come from, I mean, some are new ideas, but we've had a lot of ideas just kicking around, waiting, you know, to find their place. Shinju is probably one of the more recent ones, actually. The, the newest one was Violent Delights with the saxophone. That one that was a very late almost didn't make it. Fucking- that's a great fucking track. Mm-hmm. That one almost didn't make it because it was right at the very end. Yeah. Glad I'm it glad did, it though. Did. <laughs> glad it did. We're delighted. Yeah. Violently? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's, <laughs> Michael's one interjection so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> My quota is one per show. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. See you guys. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, see you later. Right, hey, it's been go. real. <laughs> but no, man. Um, yeah, like just the songwriting was really good. Like, what was what was uh, some of the uh, first things you wrote for this one, uh, if, you, if you can call that? Uh, so there's actually a few tracks on this that are reworked and re-recorded versions of things that we had done quite a while ago uh like little misanthropy incommunicado that's that's the oldest one incommunicado and then uh living fiction actually those were those were things that we'd had before and we were like these are really solid and it's taking us forever to come up with these these new songs and kind of get them fleshed out so we can rework these and make them polished because the, the way I've always thought about it is if you have a really good melodic hook, it doesn't matter like in like which way it's presented or with which instruments, it's going to be like good regardless and, and timeless. So you can always just update the production around it. And that's kind of what we uh-huh. thought of with those songs where like we can we can update the production a little bit, update the mixes and throw them on it and they'll they'll be solid still. And actually, like one thing, while well, it's on, while well, it's on my mind that I wanted to say um, about <clears throat> about all these songs, I personally enjoy the fact that it, does, it like nobody outshines the other in a negative fashion on any of these songs. Like every every instrument has the correct time, uh, the correct time and place within each song to shine. Like I really enjoy the drum work that Michael does in a lot of these tracks, as far as the build and just yes. because. It's cool to hear like some of the inventiveness, like placement wise. It's really cool, Talk and it, I mean the fucking rhythm section, like Mike and Talk Peter, you guys are fucking solid shit. And the the whole the whole thing is it's so 
very well done cohesively. A lot of times when we're writing uh, ideas, we don't just come up with like, oh, here's a random guitar part or a random drum part. We'll come to the other guys with like, oh, here's a whole section, you know, with vocals and guitars and synths and whatever. And so being able to write with everything in front of you helps kind of put those things into perspective and like pick the spots where certain things can shine and, and take the background and whatnot. It's cool that Brett and Josh pretty much handle almost all of the writing. So like, like, like Brett was saying, they'll write almost an entire song and then show it to, you know, me and Peter and you, we can kind of tweak it and like, you know, they'll have like a blueprint drum track of like, you know, this is what we think. And then, you know, feel like, hey, you know, you can change it, add fills and you kind of tweak it to, you know, your playing style. So all of our influences are really shown in every song. So that's cool, too. Like here and there will be like these, this, these certain hits kind of have to be there. So all the instruments sync up for like powerful rhythm things or whatever. But then everything else in this section, you can kind of just... Yeah, do whatever. like a kick pattern with a guitar chug, like obviously so has to line up. But you know, other than that, it's you know pretty much up to our interpretation. So it's yeah, it's cool to hear everybody's influences because we do come from relatively different backgrounds, at least these days. Yeah, you can. Uh, most of our old stuff has been successfully wiped from the internet. But if you were <laughs> able to hear that and then hear the new stuff, especially uh, with Michael as the drummer, it's it it's an insane difference because. Uh, the people that we worked with before were not really cut out for the kind of music that we were wanting to play. And then Michael is almost too good for what we do. <laughs> Cause he's like, he comes from a super metal background and he's like out playing everyone else. Like it's, it's crazy. Sometimes we have to be like, Hey, tone it down. man. <laughs> I was, so I was stoked to get to re-record some of those older tracks though. Cause uh, those were around before I was a part of the band, so you know when I learned them, I had a lot of fun playing them, and I was I was stoked to get to kind of rework them a little bit and just kind of put my spin on them. So that yeah, I had a lot of fun doing that. I mean, just the production value is it's obvious like how talented y'all are, not just individually as instrument wise. It's like y'all cohesively know how to make it sound so dynamic and epic to where it's you know, a beautiful, like I said, a beautiful adventure the whole entire way from song one until the end. Yeah, and also the way you guys write, it was it was funny, it just reminded me too <clears throat> how you say like, you know, Brett and Josh do like the majority of the um, songwriting. It actually reminds me of uh, our friends in Straight Shot Home, how fucking Wesley and Austin kind of do that with, with like the drums. They, cause they, they'll, they'll lay out some drums like on a program just to placeholder. Mm -hmm. And then, like, their drummer comes in and, like, does his thing. And mm -hmm. it's really well done. Like, I like that dynamic. It is cool to see that not just them and you guys, but I've heard a lot of bands that do it that way. And they, they probably should, honestly, because I feel like that's one of the best ways to get it out and demo it and, you know, self-critique it and then and improve upon the sound. Right. And then you kind of have ideas where it's like, okay, I wouldn't have played it like this, you know, whatever instrument it is. I wouldn't have played it like this. But now that I hear it or see it, how, how this is, I'm going to take that and I'm going to put my flair to it. And it's just a giant collaboration uh, effort on all four members' part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like how it works like that. And I especially like having everything demoed out first. Like, Michael and Peter are definitely good enough musicians to jam, like if they were in another group, to jam out and write a song and stuff. Brett and I, <laughs> we have to be behind a, a fucking keyboard or I don't think we could write shit. We would not survive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've, I've, we are, we are, uh, we are very talented band members to have, but, uh, on, as far as the instrument side of things, I think Michael and Peter take the cake on it. For sure. I know they, Peter's, <laughs> Peter's the bass player, but he could like run circles around me on a guitar still. <laughs> I hate the bass player memes. Like, if you're, if you actually think that kind of shit about bass players, you should get a new bass player or write better bass parts because it's a very, very important instrument. Like, I think you guys should get a new bass player. I think we you should do too. too? <laughs> like, the shit. It can't work like this. You. No, one hundred percent agree. I'm all alone in this world. <laughs> 
everybody betray me. I'm fed up with this world. <laughs> you betray <laughs> me. <laughs> he just fucking, he just says fucking Tommy Wiseau's himself out of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gone. Fuck this shit. I did not fuck up the band. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, hi, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> hi, Josh. Uh, Will you fight? Oh, Will you die? To present. Oh, shit. Brett quotes oh, Tommy Wiseau on a daily basis. I, we can. We need to do a tally next time we're on the road of how many times he goes... You're tearing me apart. Is it going to be like a swear jar? Like every time he's got to put <laughs> a, a why dollar, dollar jar. Why is there a jar? <laughs> we'll find our <laughs> next tour. Yeah, we'll find this. <laughs> just have his face on the jar and just have all yeah. the, 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 the Tommy jar. Just, just sit there. Perfect. <laughs> like, Hi, doggy. You just, have, you just have to look at his fucking face every time you play. You're just like, well, I'm giving you more money. It's not like I have a good God damn it. I'm your kitchen. Puts the dollar in. Oh, hi, George. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Go out to the crowd. Oh, hi, crowd. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. We should actually... That's that's pretty good. Okay, yeah, what? Oh, hi, yeah. crowd. Like, I think, I think for, maybe for the Halloween show, you could you could probably do a pretty good time. Walk like, out on oh, stage. Oh, hi, oh, hi crowd. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. If you guys dressed up like... Um, all of, like, all the of characters? Them, like, uh, and then, uh, <laughs> Johnny and... Danny and all those guys just dressed up like him. We, we, we need like costume ideas. As well. That yeah. would be such a good stage intro. Like, maybe some sort of, like, epic, like, build into one of our actual songs. Just, like, in a track or something. And then it just stops and Brett walks out on stage alone. He's like, oh, hi, crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Start the song. The next project should be called The Wise Guys. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my Before God. I, oh, hi, drop. <laughs> Every time. Yeah. Oh, hi, Drop. It away just takes it. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah, and, like, I guess we can talk about that a little bit and go back to the album. Like, um, because we definitely got into conversations, you know, before we did this, you know, we've been talking on and off for a few months now. And as far as, like, cult movies, because, like, I remember, um, I think Miami Connection was one of the movies we kind of hit it off on and shit like that. What are some of your you guys' favorites? Because we we talked about it a little, but not in too much in depth. Like it was just like a couple of them here and there. Obviously, like The Room and like Miami yeah. Connection. Are there any of those movies that you guys just it, you absolutely have to watch? As far as like, it's so bad that it's good. That oh God. Know, I feel I feel like we're a little bit more on the normy side of this than you guys are, Probably. though. Watch, listening to your your show has has shown me a few that I haven't seen before, though I don't I can't pull the names out of my ass right now because I'm trying to think of them. But like, no, we're, put your pants back on. Yeah, bigger bigger cult movies and like cult series and stuff. Like we're all huge Evil Dead fans. Uh, we we all went as a band to see Big Trouble in Little China. I'll probably go every time it does. Michael should do special showings. Michael was busy, but we had a cardboard cut out of it. We did have a cardboard <laughs> cut out of Michael when we saw it. That's my all time favorite movie. Uh, on tour, we watched like Showdown Little Tokyo, bunch of bunch of mm-hmm. like shitty old martial arts films and stuff. Like you can find a lot of them at truck stops. Yeah, like stuff you never heard of. It's just great to pick up and see what they have. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how many cult around. movies. I or I know that are that I like because they're so bad they're good. I mean I think of movies like, like like Starman's like the most underrated John Carpenter movie in my opinion. Is that a cult movie? I, I don't know if it, I see I don't know if that's considered cult because I don't hear anybody talk about it. But it's like, I've told Josh he needs to watch it because it's it's a it's Jeff Bridges before he was a name actor. Have you guys seen that? No, I haven't. Negative. Nope. <laughs> No one here besides me has seen Starman? Mm-mm. So that'll be one for the next tour. We'll watch it. It's, Hell yeah. It's a good... It's, it's better to watch these when we're all together. It's an it, yeah. it's interesting because it is John Carpenter who's like the biggest name in this type of uh, like cult movie, but it, it's like cult even by Carpenter standards, I guess. I guess you gotta, you gotta separate the B movies and cult movies that are kind of their own thing. Or, I mean, there's, there's overlap, but... <laughs> I guess it'll be considered call considered that the thing is pretty much overshadowing anything else that he's put out there. So yeah, but I mean, it's, I think so. I mean, if it, even if it's not considered cult, it's still considered to be like you know a B movie first. Like you know, yeah. like if, if you look at what Carpenter is more famous for, 
some of his other works that come across like that would probably be considered more B movie, and I would consider them cult because of you know they're they they're known somehow. Even if people are not readily always talking right. about it, they're they're still they're known on some level. And when you find it, it's like a fucking treasure. You know? Yeah, like I mean, they're just diamonds in the rough. I mean, what is a cult movie? It's usually, it's a movie that bombs or like doesn't do like nearly as well as expected, and then later gets picked up and yeah, everyone I, fucking loves I it. I guess that's a that's a pretty good. Definition. Yeah, like bi- like Big Trouble in Little China fucking bombed. Mm-hmm. You know, I would even. Count I don't that think as, that could have been successful until later on, just because of. I don't. I don't even consider that a so bad. It's good movie because I'm. I think that's it a is, legitimately good movie. It's yeah, absolutely. It's, it's absolutely aware of what it is doing. And it's fucking hilarious. It's yeah. like the what's the quote from a uh, Back to the Future, like you're gonna have to be more specific. You're, no, like you're, you're not ready for that, but your kids are gonna love it. Oh, no. yeah, that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's big trouble, little China. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true, man. Like, cause, and it's weird how cult films work out that way. They're either so bad they're good, or they're just they're fucking good, but just didn't get enough recognition. Like, honestly, uh, Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai is one yeah. for me. I love fucking. There, movie. that is. The spiritual predecessor to Big Trouble, in my opinion. Yeah, same. And honestly, like, I, this is probably going to be like a spoiler for you know a future episode, but like that's that's one of the pairings that I had put together for an eventual cult cinema showdown episode was hey. that Big Trouble in China. So it's you know that's it was beta, beta. Yeah, exactly. So. <laughs> but yeah, man, like it's cool because I feel like those movies can be inspirational to people that are writing films or, like, they want to go for that. And hell, I have, like, and you guys are, you know, some of them, I've seen musicians that watch that stuff for inspiration for music because, dude, along with the movies being hidden gems, some of the fucking scoring and soundtrack work in those movies are underrated. Oh, yeah, especially Carpenter. Carpenter's still one of the best, like, synth artists out there. His stuff is, it's not, like... It's not the same type of production you get from the more mainstream synthwave, retrowave artists, but it's it still fits in that mold, and he's he's from. the OG. And I mean, they wouldn't they wouldn't exist without him. So. <laughs> Let's not forget Dragon Sound. <laughs> Did you guys know? I mean, not to all keep on bringing it back to this film because I could talk about it for fucking ever because it is the best film of all time. But Big Trouble in Little China is actually the first film to use a uh, like synth sampler to sample different instruments in the soundtrack. Definitely knew that. That's that so fucking that cool. That was like yeah. one of the biggest selling points for that fucking soundtrack for me. Was Love like, it. Holy shit! You know, it's awesome. I, I am such a fucking geek when it comes to getting into the actual production side of shit, as opposed to like what came from it sound wise. But like, I want to know how this shit was made. Mm-hmm. You could do a whole episode with just Brett talking about our album that way. <laughs> yeah. No shit. And that's awesome. Also- yeah, honestly, like, Cody and I get to sit here and talk about music all fucking day long. Because as much as we're into movies and shit, like, we are just as much into music, you know? Yeah, because I was just talking to him not long ago. Like, we we did so many episodes based on music, so now we're trying to figure out what else to talk about outside of music. Because we just, we get off on a derailment of just anything musically inclined, so. Yeah, I mean, I always hate when people say that, like, music, I mean, it's, it's going to be in every generation, but, like, music used to be so much better back in the day, but it's like, we have such a overflow of quality music and movies and just media in general right now it's insane like the quality of everything coming out right now we'll never be able to consume it all nope my big my biggest existential (laughs) threat man to go i was i was gonna say to go back to the carpenter talk right quick because i thought about it while we were in the middle of like you know discussing that one thing as far as his score work that we liked was in the most recent Halloween sequel reboot that they just did. Mm -hmm. And I I remember I saw the movie before Cody and I told him, I said, dude, there is a scene in that movie where there is just this really like string based sounding, um, guitar, like tone with a volume swell in it that just really amps up the, not the, uh, not the shitty cringe, but but like the scared (laughs) cringe. Yeah. And that one scene where it's like, and I'm like, oh my god, it sounds fucking scary as shit. Like, I legitimately got chill bumps when that music hit. And I know exactly which random. part you're talking about. Dude, it's fucking legitimately, like, some of the most badass scoring work I have heard in fucking two decades, honestly. I love that shit. It's, and his son is just as good, too. Well, 
well, it's amazing that a movie series that old can hold up even with a newly made version of it on all aspects, not just the movie itself, but on the score as well. Because some of them, they do one or the other. They don't do the whole package. Yeah, exactly. I, I was super impressed, not to like discount John Carpenter, obviously, because he's, he's like the master, but that he would was able to score a modern movie and have it not feel out of time. Like, it still feels fresh and contemporary and like but with his his feel to it i guess because he's an older guy you know yeah because he did yeah that was the thing too is like you just said he didn't lose any of um his flair to it at all it just sounded like if somebody if we had never heard this guy before like ever if somebody just plucked carpenter and dropped him into what 2018 when the movie came out just dropped him in and you're just like who the fuck is this guy and he listened (laughs) holy shit, this is badass. Go back and listen to his old stuff, and you're like, wow, that sounds really retro, but I can tell it's John. Yeah. And like I said before, his kid is just as fucking good as he is, and like that is cool as shit to watch, too. Cody is amazing. I don't think I'm super familiar with that. Oh, dude, yeah, Cody Carpenter does some really good work, too. Like, in fact, uh, he co-scored that move, that Halloween with um, his dad and also this uh, musician named Daniel Davies, who at one point actually was CKY's frontman for like a short bit. Oh, wow. Like huh. in like two, yeah, like in 2012 or some shit. My he first rock concert was CKY. That's a good riff, though. Play that same yeah. song. Same <laughs> song, all right. Carver City is a really good album from them. Yeah. Like, I don't know if y'all listen to that, but Carver City's fucking brilliant. And then uh, Darren's new project's pretty good, too. So, like, anybody out there listening, go check that shit out. <laughs> yeah. But to get it back to you guys and y'all and y'all's music, um, of all these tracks, like, you've just, you've just dropped this album. Uh, I think at least for us, because we've said this a couple times, like, Living Fiction is absolutely both of our collective favorite track, but there is, like, some other shit on here. Like, Violent Delights is really good. Not um, Human's really good. Yeah, Not Human is fucking brilliant. Uh, Partner in Time, Partner in Crime is a really good one, too. And uh, Little Misanthropy, Victim of Inertia, Memorial. I mean, the whole fucking album. I'm sitting here naming all the whole album. <laughs> I love it. Um, which of these right now... If you're playing all of them, which I, I would assume you're playing most of them, what is your favorite one of these to play live right now? Uh, probably different for each of us. You want to go first? Yeah. Uh, I, it's not... There's, like, parts of each one for me that I really like. Right now, I, I would say that when we did our um, our uh, release show, the, the part where When Within Cells transitions to Interlinked, and it just kind of punches you in the face, like, yeah. it com- it, like it comes out swinging. I really like that in particular part of the whole album because it 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 it, it has the like metal elements that <clears throat> that we all like have from our like from our childhood or like when we were listening to more intense stuff and and but it also has all the sense stuff that we're we've been wanting to do now. I mean, it's kind of a really good blend of what you're going to get going forward. So I, I would say that part is really fun to play. And your bass line's sweet there. Yeah, it starts with just the bass. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it does. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, that's <laughs> why. <laughs> that's my favorite. <laughs> um, oh, for me, though, I think Violent Delights might be my favorite song on the album at this point. But that's... It's kind of unfair because we've fresh. we've all heard these f- fucking way too many times. We don't know what's so, good anymore. Yeah, it's... It's hard to tell what what our favorites are, 
after hearing them so much, but I'll say Violent Delights for now. Uh, for me, my favorite to play live would probably have to be <sighs> probably Shinju still, honestly. I really like playing that one live. Uh, I, it's not my favorite song on the album at the moment, but just live, I like it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I like playing, uh, Recently, I like playing Not Human just because I sing a little less on that. So there's a little more chance for me to really move around on stage and go a little crazier than normal. And uh, as far as favorite, I don't know. I, the biggest thing that was that I was interested in finally putting this album out was seeing what people would gravitate towards. Yeah, I was going to say like, that. A lot of people have told us they love Partner in Time. And like I had no idea people would really like that one, so it's like we're also thinking about future music videos and like what we want to push later on from the same album. So hearing things like that like is yeah. super helpful and like helps put a perspective on like oh this is what people people are enjoying. That now. one in particular, we've been wanting to do an Evil Dead themed music video for yeah. for the longest fucking time, and we've just never been able to find or build one of the those right sets. To do it really badly. Uh -huh. <laughs> that would be amazing. As shit. We'll make it happen. Oh, for me, uh, Partner. Partner is definitely my favorite live. Um, so Partner live, and I think on the album, just listening wise, I think within Cells and Inner, like the first two tracks, because I like how it starts with that real eerie synth tone. Like it just like catches your attention right away, and like Peter was saying, it just kind of just goes from that into the heavy. So it just like like he said, sets the tone for the whole album. But I just I love that that transition in those two tracks too. But definitely Partner live, because they were saying I come from a heavier background, so that's definitely little heavier, a little faster, and it's a lot of fun for me to play live, so that's definitely a good one. Yeah, that's a, that's a hell of an opening, like, duo of songs right there, especially. Just, like you said, it, it just comes out swinging, and it just works. It, it sets the tone for the rest of the album, and it doesn't let up. It hikes you up for, like, what's coming up. Yeah, yeah, like yeah that's the, that was kind of what we were going for. It's, like, kind of set the tone and, like, show people a little bit of, of everything. The lyrics on interlinked originally all of them were stolen from every other song on the record and i was it just i was trying to do some kind of cool artsy thing and you know make an intro song showing off everything eventually we, to make it have any kind of sense whatsoever we had to write some new stuff for it but there are a lot of uh reused lyrics in that still from the other songs. Instead we threw all the other songs from the record into the interlude. That's true. <laughs> interlinked has this this uh, thing in it that I, I I started calling an anti anti chorus oh, yeah. uh, because I think this is something that Josh kind of oh, this is a bread uh, idea. Well, well, Josh talking to me about this just kind of about other music is like uh, people don't know when to use like open space, especially in a band. I think we even had this problem ourselves with our older music that it was always in your face all the time and there was a ton of shit happening at once. And so, like the beginning of Interlinked, it has the like it has the fast guitar part, and it has the I mean everything's hitting you, and but then when it gets to the chorus, it like all drops out, and it, typically the chorus is supposed to be like this like climactic point, and it's like the opposite for Interlinked, and it, everything drops out, and I really like how uh, Brett and Josh were able to make it like this just open space that doesn't really feel like a chorus, but it is the chorus, so. I mean, just like this. Dude, sometimes, yeah, sometimes less is more, honestly. That's mm -hmm. the, that was a really good lesson for us to learn, I think, too. Because, I mean, you can even see that in Shinju, like in the in the verses. I mean, that was like one of the first times we were like, undistorted guitar? What? Yeah. <laughs> I want more of that. Right. I like a lot of the clean guitar work that happens in there, too. There's, there's a, there's a um, few instances where that really, um, it, everything shines out really well. I noticed, uh, there was a few instances where that shined out, even if it was just like a small, like three, four second piece. That's I all there is in it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's all you well, get. A little nuance like that, man. I want to do more because it, it really does juxtapose really well with the heavier stuff. Like, gets. I'm a huge fan of that too. Yeah, that it's it's like a at night when I turn on the t turn on TV or a podcast to go to sleep, I turn the volume really low, but my my alarm really loud, so oh my, my ears are like super attentive and then in the morning I get waking up really easily. <laughs> One of the themes when I'm writing stuff, especially all over this album, is contrast. 
you know, between sections and tonalities and, you know, rhythms and feels, most of our songs from section to section, whether it's a verse to chorus or whatever, don't have the same style of drum beat or the same style of guitars. And so, I don't know, I just hear a lot of music where it's the same throughout and there's nothing wrong with that, but I just, for my own brain, I always have to switch it up quite often. Yeah, there is a such a thing as getting stale after a certain period of time, so you want to have that differential here and there to kind of keep it from not being such. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Fuck. Sorry, we, this date isn't going very well. <laughs> we all had a really late night, so after we're like, we got back from... No, no excuse. We got back from... What you, it's an excuse for me, dude. <laughs> I'm, you guys got to nap. I drove. We got back from Omaha, and I think Brett got home at like 6.30. I don't even know when Josh got home. Like 6.40-ish. 6 40, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we, we get that. We, uh, shit, I know myself, I had a late night last night, too. I didn't go to sleep until probably like 6, 7, 8 o'clock tomorrow, sometime around. I got like a four hours of sleep. Oh, Jesus, my God. I can't do like, I gotta, I gotta wake up. Like, it was weird too because I fell asleep and I was like, oh my god, I'm, I'm gonna take advantage of this. I'm gonna sleep really well. Hour later rolls by, I wake up and I'm sure like, we have all been there. People out there listening, you have been there too. You wake up and you're just like, fuck, I'm awake. Yup. <laughs> <laughs> fuck, I'm up. <laughs> like your eyes open and just say fuck out of your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Brad was talking about. Uh, <laughs> I was right, talking uh, about themes in this album, and it's it's interesting to kind of pick what is what the overarching motif is in this album because we originally we didn't have an idea for that. Like I mean, with songs like Little Misanthropy and Incommunicado, and they were already there, so you like we already had them written. But then you have like Interlinked and Not Human and Violent Delights were all under this this kind of umbrella of like cyberpunk and like the question of we just write about robots now. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Here's the thing. A lot of our old lyrics were kind of vague and uplifting and, like, mysterious enough that when we were like, this is a themed album, none of them didn't fit with it. Like, everything still, you can... If you think about the overarching theme of the album being what it means to to be human or kind of like a Blade Runner, Westworld kind of feel. Everything, like the lyrics from the other songs could still fit within that, even if they weren't originally intended to be that way. Mm. That's really cool, though, like to hear that kind of background for that stuff and, and that, it's, that it will still work. You know, because I, th I think lyrically, because I've had to write lyrics before, too, and... If you can write well enough to where it's in, it can be interpreted however the listener wants to, I think that's a, a huge win, being able to do something like that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I mean, you, you could probably tell like different writing styles between songs. I know Brett, <laughs> yeah, Brett writes uh, a lot of beautiful, well-thought-out lyrics, and there's usually a lot more of them in the songs he writes. And then I come up with like one or two words really cool that words. sound cool to a melody <laughs> like shinju i that whole song started out with i was like on my way home one night i was like when your hopes are falling and i was like ooh, and that could be a harmony and then just fucking built the song around it that's it <laughs> same with like living fiction just come up with like dumb melody ideas that stick in my head and i'm like we could make that into a cool song sometimes josh will just have me write shit yeah and he just like spins it into different things like that's not humans lyrics was He's like, Peter, write a song about robots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and I don't I don't think he specifically uses any of those. Nope, like, I just take him for inspiration. He just, he just, <laughs> yeah, I'm his muse. Exactly. Men, more than one way. Aww. Musician. No. <laughs> Did you guys hear the cat? <laughs> Callie. I fucking love... I was going to say, I fucking, I fucking love whenever song ideas are born out of, like, one thing. And you hear the whole song, and you get told, like, oh, this this little part right here, just that, that three-second clip right there that you can barely hear because we, we kind of dial it back a bit, that, that, that is the catalyst for the rest of this fucking song. Yep. Mm -hmm. Kind of the opposite of that was, is Violent Delights. Josh, years ago, I want to say, like, 2015 or 2016, Josh sent me this really shitty 
MIDI like version of like the and it yep. sounded really I mean looking back it's probably still on his SoundCloud oh, somewhere, yeah, it is. but it's the worst synth voice ever for that but it was still a good but, melody <laughs> but that was the thing I was like this could be something really special and then lo and behold like fucking four years later at the tail end of the album cycle we throw it in there and it ends up being one of our favorites yeah it took, yeah, a, it took a while to build that song. And it was, I, I noticed, uh, Josh, it was funny. You were putting out, like, you wanted to um, ask my people, you know, what's your, what's your top five tracks? You were doing this on Facebook. And um, it made me laugh because it was like, where are my Cindy boys? At? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm cool with it. I went and I checked the plays this morning, and it has received a fair amount of love. I think... I think part of uh, the re- overall response, like, I'm glad every kind of song on the album, like, because it, it does span a bunch of different sounds, is getting love. But uh, Kansas City is a very pop punk heavy kind of scene and, like, emo and metal and stuff. Yeah, and, anymore. Yeah, I feel like it used to be just straight up metal core. It used to be metal core, yeah. And now I, I feel like they're all gone. Uh, I don't yeah, think I can tell like you punk. the most active local bands in yeah. Kansas City right now. At least that. <laughs> Us. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> but um, yeah. So the, I I was like, man, I I hope, I hope no one, like liking Violent Delights on my status is more of a reflection of the kind of like pop punk kids I have on my friends list versus like, the <laughs> overall listening base there's gonna be on like Spotify and online and stuff. It was so all. It was it was really interesting reading that post though that you like that that one you made asking yeah. the top five. It was so interesting to see. Like one, which which tracks were in like people's number one, and then who they like, who it was. You yeah. Because there was a lot of surprises. Like oh, oh yeah. wait, like they like that one the best. Yeah. Like, you know, it's it's cool to see. It's different when it's people that have known you and been following you mm-hmm. from the beginning. Especially. That makes it more interesting because like some people are like, oh, they've got to like this song the best, you know, and they're like, oh, actually, I like this one. It's like, yeah, oh, what really? the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Brett wrote Brett wrote that a uh, victim of inertia song with Peter. Like Peter wrote these crazy dark emo lyrics i wrote a really sad and depressing <laughs> song and brett's like i'm gonna write the first major key to the happiest song. song we have <laughs> on the album and i was not like i loved the chorus but i wasn't super sold on the song i was like this doesn't fit the aesthetic of the album i i, I was i won't say i'm crushed but i was a little disappointed because <laughs> i i spent i won't say you, guys, you all spent the least amount of time on that it was mainly just one that i kind of put together towards the end and they were like eh Let's throw it on though. <laughs> but a lot of people I, seem people to like love it. it. There's like, it's a number one for redemption. a lot of people on my uh, on my it's, friends list. Uh, the status redemption thing, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel a little better about it now. I've had a few people say the bridge on that is like one of the highlights of our album. And really? I'm, Whoa. Because I'm I'm not down. even sold on that bridge. Yeah. But hey, I'm gl- I'm glad other people like it. Yeah, we'll take it. See what I have to put up with. <laughs> Brett, we we love you. <laughs> I know, we, we like hey, whatever, um, it, I mean, it sucks having my, it. the most of my lyrics in one song, and then Josh and Michael being like, this is the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> Stop writing emo shit, Peter. Everyone gets a redemption arc. Grow up. Everybody gets one. Mm. Tell them, Peter. Uh. <laughs> Fuck. But, uh, we, we like whatever, um, whatever... Josh, whenever you were talking to me um, about the album in general, and I was just telling you, and this goes back to, like, you guys being surprised by, like, people that you've either known for a while or people that, like, you're interested in hearing opinions on. It honestly meant a lot when you told us that, like, um, coming from us, like, the opinion that we had of your album meant something. Because we, we, we always sit here and we're just like, we're just a couple of dumb fucks from Louisiana that like to listen to shit and talk about movies and music. Yeah, like, who listens to two guys in the swamp talk about shit? You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, that, we did. That was, really, that was really cool, you know, uh, to, to hear that that mattered. And I like that that's what you're looking for is honest opinions about things. Even if somebody's like, this isn't that good, it's like, okay, yeah. well, we can take this. And yeah. Okay, I mean, I see um, what I see what you share and what you post and, like, the labels you follow. And, like, I, I know what you guys are into, and I know that I... I like a lot of it, so that's that's why it definitely your opinion does matter a lot more than, say, just some random person I don't know. But um, also yeah, hearing we, you guys talk about Shinji way back when was really cool too. Yeah, mm-hmm. that, I was like, oh shit, 
someone someone cool like you guys like <laughs> understood what we were going yeah on. you <laughs> nailed it you commented on it like bullet points essentially you're like listed every single aspect of it that we were going for like you nailed every single point you're like the lights are this this and this this part of the song is this this and this like you just listed out basically <laughs> my mental breakdown of how i wrote it with listed the band and everything like breakdown. it's it was a uh, it was spot on so that that was a uh, kind of eye opening for me i was like shit someone really does get it because we got a lot of people that are like Oh, this is a emo scene music just because we all like look like scene kids some somehow and like Only one of us does. I'm trying to be nice here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's like, can you fucking hear the song? What this sounds like? Because this is it is weird. Sometimes. Name one other band that like has something that sounds like this because we we tried very hard to make sure there wasn't. It is interesting to see the people like it always seems to be the same type of people that say that though. It's always That's all right. People yeah. in their between their like 35 to 45, it's always I mean, you can you could kind of like put them all next to each other and like a I don't know, a fucking usual it's the, it's the usual suspects pretty much. Like the same people say the same negative shit. And it doesn't bother us, I mean, because if it did, we wouldn't be able to do this because we would all hate ourselves. We like it. We have fun with the negative comments. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, I live for those. It lets, yeah. us, it lets us know our music's getting out to more than just our friends and family. It's crazy because you'll see some local bands around here because we're, we work with so many with uh, my, my design work and Brett's, Brett's uh, recording and just us being involved in the scene. We work with so many local bands that when one of them gets a hate comment from like a stranger somewhere on the internet it's a big deal and they make a big post about it and for us it's like we were going through the <laughs> kingdom hearts video and we posted it oh and God. that was one we promoted to instead of just fans of our kind of music we just promoted it to that fan base you ruined kingdom holy hearts holy shit me, that was yeah is tens of Tens kingdom of Hearts thousands three of ruined Kingdom Hearts. It was, either, it was either we ruined the song or break ruined. in a haircut. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's interesting, though, because while there's a lot of bad comments, there's not a lot of truly bad people. And if we can respond in a funny way, usually they we can win bad. them over. And they like, It's All right, crazy you know. how many times someone has left a shitty comment and we just, like, give them, like, a funny gif or something. And then they come back the next day and they're like, I checked out your music. I'm a huge fan. They like the page and like order <laughs> merch and shit. It's, it's yeah. wild. People it's don't a, expect you to interact with them online. Yeah, it's a lot it's easier to be Yeah, because they're, to, they're used to commenting on like a big band, like a huge band or artist or whatever. Yeah. That's never going to respond. And then when we do, they're like, oh my God, they responded. You they know? paid it's attention like, to it's me. It's like, now what? You know? It's a lot easier to be mean to a faceless entity. Right, right. They're not expecting you to respond when they leave a hate comment. They're just like, oh, uh-oh, like, now what do I say? Like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't expect to go this far. What the fuck do I do? Yeah. yeah we don't get, we, particularly Cody and I don't get butthurt if we see any kind of negative comment because the first thing we think is like, okay, we have, like, a, like immediate witty response, and it's like, that's the only fucking way we know how. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Oh, this is funny. But the thing is, like, I'll sit there and look at it like, well, no, we're just here to stir up the peasants, so, you know, fuck off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and even even in the songwriting process, like, we don't seek validation. I know Brett doesn't so much, but I have a very small network of people that I really trust their opinion, like, musically, and then None of on production-wise. Right <laughs> and I and I will run our ideas by them, and some of them are pretty brutal, like to the point where Brett is like, "Are you fucking serious? You sent it to that guy again?" <laughs> 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 this guy named uh, Mitchell Heijdel in the Netherlands. I always send him our mixes, and he's like, "How have you been doing this so long, and it is still shit <laughs> like, every single time?" <laughs> It has been five years. Is Brett still mixing with no subs or something like that? It's, it's ridiculous. Oh he he is the worst. But I credited him on the album because like he he does hear things that like I don't hear, and we get ear fatigue or even just creative fatigue from hearing things way too many times. And we we take it with okay. a grain of salt. But it's good it's good to have outside ears definitely mm -hmm. that aren't okay. afraid to tell you if something needs fixed. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, we get that completely. It's uh. You, because it's not even so much like you become numb to it, but you just, like you said, you hear it so often that it, shit just starts kind of running together. Everywhere. Yeah. Like, I need somebody else to hear this, and please be honest with it. So when you're self-producing especially. Do I'm sorry? When you're self-producing especially, because oh, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of sad that I can't 
have some sort of selective amnesia and like hear our songs for the first time because I see all these bands come in and record in Brett's uh, Red Roof Studios here in Kansas City and he'll he'll show me like messages they send him after he sends them the final mixes and it's like they they come in and they record and then they get to hear this beautiful finished product and it's like opening a fucking awesome birthday present and for us we just hear it like from the start mm. to the little bit more polished to the little bit more polished until it's done and at that point it's like when is it done that's a good <laughs> point though a lot of bands that still write like jam style yeah. like, won't actually get to hear and then they the hear their track. awesome yeah. finished song and we're like must be nice yeah, yeah. <laughs> we never we never get to uh-huh. must be nice i think the trade off's worth it though it's it's nice having the control yeah it still would be cool though and i think we do want to do this at some point to like work with a like a dream producer because we have a lot of I mean I know that it'd be a scary step for us at this point but (laughs) it would be kind of scary but it would be nice to have like an outside producer who's been doing it for a long time who does it with all kinds of different bands yeah really see what they would bring to the table I mean and I mean you can always say fuck off if you don't like it yeah it would be hi hi Mr. Outside Producer here is 160 tracks of synth have fun please don't ruin it (laughs) Do your magic. Well, you say that, but I'm sure they've seen that a million times. I'd be stupid interested to see Varian work with you. I was thinking the exact same thing. Ooh. Yeah. Varian has actually heard some of our stuff through my friend uh, Jeff Essinger, if you if you know his music. Oh, he's, we know Essinger. Yeah, he's... Know him, but we, we know who we know all of. Yeah. He, uh, I think he's going to be you guys' new favorite artist very soon. Yeah. I hope he blows up. Not to make path. this episode about him, because you need to have him on eventually, but uh, holy fuck. Yeah, yeah he, and then when you hear his music and then you actually talk to him, you're going to be like, how the hell did this fucking goofball... <laughs> <laughs> the most talented man, I know, but, like, he he's a character. I love him. He, I actually forced him to move to Kansas, and then uh, he, he, he worked on some of the songs with us, uh, helping with some, like, auxiliary electronic production, and, like, mm-hmm. helping us flesh out some parts. He's... Because he's 100% synths all the time, so it's good to have someone who's not... Uh, balls deep and the rest of the song kind of have an outside ear and work on some of it. That's kind of how, um, as far as the, like, you hear the music and then like you talk to the person and they're goofy. That was the exact thing that happened when we got to talk to uh, Andrew Zink, the guy that does uh, the Dream Chaser mm. project. We had him on a couple weeks ago for an interview. That dude is funny as shit. What was that one project with, like, bro... Bro job. Bro job. Bro job. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is that yeah, him? We, we talked to Andrew, and that dude is fucking phenomenally talented, and he's funny as shit. <laughs> but, yeah, dude, as your man, uh, he, he just had a Monster Cat release, uh, I think, like, last week or something yep. like that. I know you guys follow Monster Cat. That was his first one. Monster... Hey... You guys have connections at Monster Cat. Tell them they're fucking up by not signing him because he is, his new stuff is at a, an incredibly higher level than almost everything I've heard on Monster Cat. And I'm not saying that to be mean. <laughs> just just telling you. <laughs> it's it's going to blow your mind when you hear it. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be surprised, honestly. If, like, if, he's, if he's got a release, if it, even if it's just a feature or it's a collab... If he's got something out on Monster Cat, typically Monster Cat does come back around and like get you know artists that have releases on there to come back and do more. I and hope so. Like, they need to hear his EP. <laughs> we yeah, actually we uh, not Monster Cat related, but speaking of collabs, we actually do have a collab coming up with him on uh, his upcoming EP. It's a Lost Boys theme song, yeah. themed right. oh, song, holy not theme shit. song. <laughs> Holy shit, that's going to be fucking awesome. It is very good. We're very so far. Well. <laughs> yeah. no, no, seriously, like, um, that, yeah, that's one of my favorite fucking movies of all time. Yeah, so same here. Like, yeah, fucking, if, if only, if everybody that had saxophone in their music could just get the dude in the leather with the fire behind <laughs> Tim him. Tim Capello. We have a signed yeah. picture that he signed. He said, uh, Young Medicine... True Lost Boys. It's our. It's in our practice space now. We get to yeah look at to it Young again. Medicine. True Lost Boys, and it just hangs on the wall in our practice space. So it's just a, you walk in, you have to like slap the sign. You know, it's like <laughs> we have to like pay homage to him. Yeah. yeah. Oh shit! 
good. Yeah, just like walk by and just correct the picture as you walk by, like. Ah. Yeah, yeah, straighten it up a little bit, like dust it off, <laughs> like oh yeah, yeah. You know he tours doing that song, the I Still Believe song. He plays like conventions yeah. and stuff, like horror cons. Just it's crazy. That song. Yeah, um, I can't remember which horror con it was. There was one that was in, I want to say in Canada. Um, I think so. But, like Shock Stock or something. I can't remember the name of it, but I think he was up there. Like, I remember seeing a video here recently of it. So, but that was cool to see. Like, this guy still does this. He's still pretty okay. ripped, too. He's like in his like yeah, late he 60s, and he's pretty shredded. Hell so yeah. is Tom Cruise. He can fucking, he can break yeah. your heart in more ways than one. Like, physically and with the saxophone. There you go. <laughs> Yeah. Kalima. He really makes that thing like scream. It's crazy. We went through uh, like three or four different sax players till we found one that worked for uh, that last song. And even then, it's it's fucking hard to like get sax to sit in a kind of hard rock metal kind of mix. Just because for that for that kind of melody, you want the there to be some grit in it and stuff, and like. When you have like fifty other fucking things going on, I think Brett ended up doing a really good job though, because we had to, we had to redo it so many times. Mm, Brits. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> yeah, finding those transitions can be difficult sometimes, just in a musician musician standpoint, because you want it to sound um, as natural as possible, yet not too abrupt. You know what I mean? You don't want yeah. it to have that kind of like. It feels like you just ran into a fucking concrete wall, yeah. and then like something else just starts happening. It's like, ooh, yeah, it just turned into a saxophone, basically. Especially because that synth, that synth line is so like thick. There's a bunch of different synths going on at the same time, and then it stops and it's one sax. But it it works really well. I feel. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Uh, before we get out of here, because we know you guys are probably still like. Yeah, a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, right, right. Um, as far as when you guys first uh, got, you know, into doing this project, um, did you guys have very difficult crowds at first? Like when you first like were would play for people that didn't know who you were? Did people just kind of like was it was it like that people didn't know how to take you? Did they immediately take to the sound or like did they look at you and go, hey, what's with the keyboard? I think yeah. a lot of times when we're being pitched to promoters or for different shows and events, if they can, you know, if they take the time to look at videos or what, they can kind of get it. But a lot of times it's not until people we work with or even, you know, the audience sees us for the first time performing that they really get what we're going for. And but I mean, even from the very first show, we had some we made some new fans there that um tipped us off to some other bands and helped us get on tours and they they were at our most recent album release show here on friday and uh yeah i think connecting with people live helps so much and uh e even with all the cool videos and online presence like you still need to be able to uh to have that connection live and so yeah just as soon as they see us it makes a lot more sense to them, at least. Shake hands and stroke cheeks. Cheese and babies, yep. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I feel like fans and just new crowds and stuff, they get it when they see it. Like people that see us generally like us, it's they way see us setting up with a key tar. Yeah. They're like, "What the hell is this?" It's way harder for promoters and booking agents to pitch us than it is, and and kind of get what they're doing, versus a fan to like see us and be like, "Oh, this is this is cool," because. We're not metal, we're not active rock, we're not synthwave, we're not pop, we're just a little bit of... But we can play with anybody in any yeah. of those genres, which exactly. is cool. Which yeah. is like what we're going for, but trying to appeal to everybody. It was a funny story, I remember when we went seeing Grammatic and Haywire, and as soon as the first act popped up, he had a trumpet in his hand, and I looked at Richie and I'm like... <laughs> What, what are we expecting here? Yeah. I looked up his name, it was Balkan Bump, and he plays Arabian trap music. What? So, Ooh. we listened to his set, and it's so off-putting to hear this guy with this, like, trap beat in the background, and him just going, burr, 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 burr. <laughs> like, it was the same melody for almost every song, and I feel bad, like, both of us feel bad about kind of, you know, kind of trashing it as much as we have in, in that manner, where it's just like, dude, like, there's talent there, but it's not being applied correctly whatsoever. 
and it was just so uh, uh, jarring, you know? <laughs> I have to interject um, before I forget, because it's trumpet-related. There's like a little Easter egg on the album. Oh, Brett's covering his head. There's a little Easter egg on the album. <laughs> In Incommunicado, after the breakdown, there's like a build. And in that build, there's a lot of trumpet. And that trumpet is all Brett playing the trumpet because he played it in high school band and he brought it back out. So in Incommunicado, after the breakdown, that's Brett playing trumpet. <laughs> yeah, I played trumpet in middle school, so... Yeah. Same! <laughs> I played trombone. <laughs> it was weird. Like, I played instruments, like, because uh, I told... You, uh, Josh, earlier, I was like, man, I've fucking been playing drums since I was about six years old, and, uh, fuck, dude, like, I, I played instruments, but I was never in band. I was in, I was a choir nerd, like, I was in chorus and choir from my kindergarten all the way until I graduated high school. Jesus. And that was, yeah, that was my thing, you know, so, I, and we would interact with, like, band, band people all the time. And I always hated that people, especially like the horn players, would get shit on because I'm like, man, that's that's not an easy instrument to fucking play. And the, and people that do that stuff are some of the most talented fucking people. It but ain't like, easy being horny. Oh my god, god damn it, man! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I missed it. What happened? I missed it. That reminded me of that fucking battery pod. And um, again, before we get out of here, uh, I know you guys have some dates coming up on. The, or you have a date or two coming up on the East Coast, correct? Is there one that's happening over? Is it Jersey or is it um, near that area? In oh, right yeah, we yeah. have. Uh, we have a pending October tour. We're waiting for it to get all the dates, but we definitely have one in uh, is it New Jersey? New York. New York. New York. It's on the it's on the Hudson River, so like right More there. On the Hudson. Yeah. yeah. So it's that'll in, be. I don't know how to say it. Pepsi. Poughkeepsie. Pepsi. 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 Ah, Pep. <laughs> the Beepus River. Pepsi Man for PlayStation Two. The Beepus River. The Beepus. <laughs> if you guys can Close book enough. that for us, we will we will play that. Sounds We're on. Sticky. <laughs> yeah, the total fuck fest in Bukaki River. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. <laughs> yeah, but we should we should have a tour that comes uh, out of Kansas City and then goes up through the East Coast in um, October, I believe. It does go down through Florida yeah. too. Yeah, we it goes down to Florida too. Florida. Yeah. Oh yeah, it is. The last two dates are in Florida. We'll cross. We will cross your uh, latitude, I guess. Where's the longitude? longitude. Either way. Yeah. <laughs> longitude. Latitude. But hopefully you guys will come near us sometime. We'd, we'd love to come out and hang with you guys and just bullshit. And yeah, dude. I want to come down to that swamp. Peter and I were talking about flying down there to just do a like a B movie one with you guys at some point because we have this ra super random uh, airline sponsorship from Spirit. So. As long as we can tell them it's band related, we can fly wherever for free. They're gonna Blame hear me. this. They're bring, gonna know. Bring your ass Blame your down here. Mouth. Don't hashtag Spirit in this podcast. I don't want them to hear that. Hashtag Swamp. No, we're not. It's okay. It's okay. We're not gonna do that. They're gonna <laughs> do no, it now. Anytime, man, anytime y'all want to do something collaborative like that, we are always fair fucking game for anything. I mean, awesome. if we do a cult on the snowdown with these guys. I would yeah. Like to do that, actually, like, eventually one day, because uh, we're, we're going to be doing a, a YouTube channel. Like, we have our YouTube channel, but we're going to be doing more live action based shit, hopefully, like, in the near future, like, coming up to the end of the year 2020. Nice. We'd love to have, uh, we would love to have you guys, like, sit in on camera with us and um, watch the movies and just bullshit about it. Because uh, the plan is eventually to um, keep releasing. Um, all of our episodes on podcast platforms, but I think um, the idea right now is to get the Cult Cinema Showdown series as one of the things that we do uh, taping of and kind of a more um, condensed version of to put on YouTube, like maybe like a 30, 45 minute version of it. Fuck yeah. That'd be, that'd be a great and, time and we would love to come down and do that movie oh weekend. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Hell or hell, we could even, if you want, we could even fly you guys up here if you want a weekend in Kansas City. Yeah, hell yeah, dude. That would be fucking fantastic. We, 
like I said, we're down for that. Y'all come down here, we'll fly up there. Either way, ask the fuck. We'll make this magic happen. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Please. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. Um, yeah, so um, you guys have the album and your artist profiles out on Spotify, Apple Music, um, fucking pretty much anywhere you can get music. Exactly. Um, uh, Go to uh, www.purevolume.com oh no. slash Young Medicine. <laughs> Holy shit! <laughs> my you space. You fucking done brought it back. <laughs> I wish. I love Pure Volume. God, Pure Volume. My God. Pure Volume, dude. Like, I haven't heard that name in a decade. <laughs> <laughs> Good shit. But no, you guys, um, you guys are on Spotify. So everybody out there listening, uh, you can scroll up to the show notes below and we'll have uh, links to their Spotify. You can follow them and listen to them and become a fan yourself because you're going to fucking do that. You're going to become a fan. Oh, I vouched that too, so yeah. Uh, if you guys have anything else you want to plug aside from like your, your uh, Instagram and your Facebook, uh, uh, Young Medicine on Instagram and Facebook, and Young yeah. Medicine on Facebook. Um, anything else you guys want to plug for you guys? No, nah, just keep sharing our music, Share, uh, sharing stream. our videos helps us out so much. So thank you guys. Word of mouth is still the most powerful tool in a musician's arsenal. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Again, everybody, everybody listening out there, Dude go likes. follow them. And uh, that album is out now. It's called Interlink. And just show these dudes love and support the fuck out of them because they're really great guys and we love them. We'll put, put pure volume in the show notes. Well. Yeah, we'll put, we'll put pure volume in the show notes. Be sure to tell everyone that we are number one hard rock and alternative rock on Reverb Nation slash Kansas City. Yeah. Are we really? <laughs> I, I have no know. fucking idea. I don't think we ever broke out. <laughs> I was going to put that on my resume. Reverb Nation. Visit them at ReverbNation.com and PureVolume.com slash what the fuck is going on. What the fuck is up, Denny? Hashtag what the fuck is up, Denny. Do not download the album leak. Uh, from E Bomb's world, it is malware. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Uh, well, again, Brett, Josh, Mike, Peter, thank you guys so very much for taking time to uh, come hang out with us and talk to us. Thank uh, you. Definitely want to have y'all back on and do some more collaborative stuff uh, visually with y'all in the future. We fucking love what you guys are doing. Can't wait to catch you on a tour or you know new music everything like we we're absolutely diehard for you guys yeah, our bodies are ready from now on so <laughs> <laughs> we're counting on it thank you so much <laughs> thanks it. guys <laughs> you know oh uh, not a problem uh we'll holler at you guys sometime down the road we'll see y'all later i'll see you bye bye later cool holy cannoli Oh. Holy God, Molly! <laughs> Holy God, Molly! Fuck yeah! Oh hi, crowd! Oh hi, crowd! <laughs> I I swear that that is gonna be funny. I it, when they do that, I wish we could be there. Uh, just I would totally dress up like uh, like Johnny. I would dress up like Lisa. I'm not even gonna lie. I'll dress up like any of these motherfuckers. Wear some cheap, 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 cheap <laughs> suits. Oh, hi, Denny. <laughs> what the fuck is up with Denny? Exactly. What the fuck is up, Denny? <laughs> <laughs> I did not. <laughs> oh, hi, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they were some great guys. I will definitely say that much. Absolutely. I'm looking forward to the day when we get to hang out and bullshit. And yeah, like we we're dead fucking serious. We definitely are planning on doing all the cult cinema showdown visual stuff in the future, and would be wonderful to have them on. Just even if it's even if it's just there for like us all to have just bullshit have comedy relief. Like even if there's no fucking valuable insight to either, any of the movies we watch, it was it's still gonna be fun. Yeah, at least have them sit down with us at the same couch and TV that we watch and be like, yeah, this is the whole magic right here. Yeah, and it's and they're gonna they're probably gonna sit there and just like here, here fucking seriously. This is yeah. it, this is it. This is where y'all do everything. This is Free. this is what you do. Yeah. They're gonna be like, God damn, y'all are awesome. Y'all can do it in this shit. It'd be funny if like they <laughs> <laughs> get like because they, they mostly like DIY it, but it'd be funny like at one point they get like a um 
get like a, a f- full blown like management team, like a full blown manager that like books all this shit, and he's just gonna be like, y- y'all y'all really book this shit? <laughs> you, you 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 fucking booked it with these guys. These two are these two are idiots. Why why would you do this? But they're promoting us. Oh well, that's all. Uh, nice. Okay, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, um, the all the stuff that we mentioned before is in the show notes below. Uh, you can find links to their Spotify, their um, their Apple, their Pure Volume. Yeah, Pure Volume. What what a fucking and Reverb Nation. What two great um, archaic uh, platforms. Like LimeWire and Napster. Yeah, if you want to go below and find the LimeWire and Napster links to Young Medicine, you can do that as well. <laughs> But yeah, follow these guys on uh, social media. They're on Instagram and uh, Facebook. So I mean, they're on Twitter too, but I think they're more active on Instagram and Facebook. So and they and they like to interact with people. So you know, like us. Yeah. Um, you already know where to find us on social media and uh, Patreon and uh, YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like all that, all that mess. Go buy some merch from us. Like all that's in the show notes below. Do the things. Yeah. But um. We're actually gonna do something we haven't uh, really done before. Like you, you've heard our, um, you've heard our for your reviewing pleasure series where we're gonna like, we play like clips of songs we talk about and talk about them track by track. But this time we're gonna do something a little different. Um, we're gonna close this podcast with their single "Living Fiction," which is fucking badass, and you're about to hear for it yourself. Like we said, the whole album's great but this song is top tier absolutely so uh with that being said we're, we're gonna sign off and let the guys take it away it's it's like saturday night live but better much better yeah <laughs> at least these days exactly uh yeah so uh until next time i've been midnight agent raw and i've been okami shades on we're off <laughs>